Yanni Dakum Hollis will go down as one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, no matter what happens at the upcoming national championships. And I'm willing to bet it's going to be something pretty special. But he just passed a major wrestling milestone that we have to discuss because this is huge for his career. The other thing that happened in wrestling headlines is one wrestler was given a decision by the NCAA that's going to affect the rest of his career. And we have to discuss what happened this past weekend in the insane dual meet upsets. Maybe the most of the entire season so far. So let's stop stalling and start talking about the first wrestling headline, which is that Yanni D and Cornell had a major exciting weekend with Yanni passing a big milestone. So they had big weekends for two reasons. The first one is, as you see on screen here, Cornell and Lehigh wrestled for their 100th meeting. This was an exciting dual meet that actually came down to the lightweights at 125 and 133. It was pretty much clinched at 125 with a Cornell win by Brent Unger with an overtime takedown. And this, not only was this a big win for Cornell in their 100th meeting, this likely is what is going to decide the EIWA for that conference this year. It's not decided yet, but those were two of the top teams in the conference. So what was the other thing that happened? And yes, that final dual meet score was 18 to 15. But the second thing that happened that was so big is that Yanni D passed a major milestone. At this point, you may be asking, okay, Josiah, what the heck is that milestone? Will you just please tell me what it is already? Well, he earned his 100th career victory. That is huge for any wrestler, and it's impressive when they pass that when they pass that match number of 100 dual meets. But Yanni passed it with a in typical Yanni fashion with a Tech Fall 16 to one win over Drew Munch in the Lehigh dual meet. Now, one of the things that I got to talk about, and there are a couple things here, is one, where does Yanni rank in Cornell's all-time wins leaders? Well, right now, he is in the top 26. He sits at 100 wins, and as you see at the all the way at the tippy top here, at number one is Gabe Dean with 152 wins, which honestly is extremely impressive, especially for the recency of that, because normally wrestlers don't get that many matches nowadays. But as I said, Gabe Dean is at the top and Yanni's not going to be able to get that high, but he may be able to get maybe, I didn't calculate it out, but 15 more matches left with the rest of the dual meets, EIWAs and NCAA. So he could crack into that like top 15 range for Cornell, which is pretty exciting. And Cornell actually put out a graphic with Yanni in all of his career victories up to this point. He has a career record right now of 102, just two career losses losses. Those are to Jaden Ironman and Austin Gomez, which came this season. Actually, he broke Yanni's big streak that went back all the way to 2017. So let's discuss some of Yanni's exciting, exciting matches. And one of the things I want to ask you, please comment below right now. What is your all-time favorite Yanni Diak Mahalas match? I'll tell you what mine is actually in just a second here. But a couple of his opponents that he beat throughout his career, one was Nick Lee of Penn State, which was a big one that came early on. Not necessarily that big as far as like at the time. It was just beating a Penn Stater. This on the screen here, you see him beating Dean Heil, which that was actually a big win for Yanni at the time because Dean Heil was a two-time national champion who he ended up beating in his first year uh, of competition at Cornell, which was definitely exciting. A couple of other victories that he had was over Jaden Ironman. Yes, he lost to him, but then he ended up beating him, who wrestled at Mizzou. Then, yeah, he did transfer to Iowa. But the other big one, and probably my favorite Yanni Jock Mahalis moment, was his match against Bryce Meredith of Wyoming. This was in the national finals. And look, nothing against this Ridge Lovett match that happened in the past year, but it wasn't that exciting of a national final. But Yanni's matches against Joey McKenna and Bryce Meredith Oh my goodness, were those exciting. So that is my favorite match from Yanni Giacomahalas. And you see just the accolades that are on these guys for four-time All-Americans, two-time national champions. Eventually, Nick Lee did win multiple national champions. And, and I think the takeaway here for me is just that Yanni has had an incredible incredible career thus far. He will go down as one of the all-time greats. No matter what happens at Nationals, uh, I'll be rooting for him to win that fourth title, but you know the weight at 149 is absolutely insane right now. People are gunning for him and want to beat him, want to be the guy that said, I caused Yanni Dean not to win the fourth national title, but man, Yanni gets into his, the zone 
at Nationals. I mean, that's his stage, and I'm excited to see what happens. So let's move on to the second wrestling headline, which is about a wrestler in the NCAA in a fun little story, maybe not so fun for Kyle Bergwick, but it did end up being a good thing. So Berwick is now declared eligible to compete for the Huskers after a transfer dispute. This is a good little article put together by Flow Wrestling explaining the situation. If you're unaware, I'll explain the situation to you. So what happened here was that Kyle Berwick, the 133-pound wrestler, now at Nebraska, was wrestling at Wisconsin for a couple years, multiple-time national qualifier, a good solid wrestler. But in the past, in the offseason, Wisconsin decided to... Or, I should say Taylor Lamont decided to come to Wisconsin and it was probably seen that Lamont was going to be the starter or at least kind of maybe the favorite in the coach's eyes. I don't, I'm, I'm reading that situation just because Lamont transferred in and Berwick wanted to transfer out. Now, unfortunately, Berwick transferred out at a wrong time past the NCAA's guidelines for when he was allowed to. And you see, he put out this whole thing on Twitter about it on social media, just saying like, I transferred out a couple weeks after I was supposed, uh, after I was able to without losing a season of eligibility. And that was, you know, did he, that was on him for not knowing that. It was probably also on the coaches for not explaining that to him. I don't blame the athlete for knowing every single compliance rule, right? Like n nobody knows all these rules. I, th I think it's a little bit silly at the time and the coaches probably should have helped him through that. And you know, it, it's a situation that goes all around. But nonetheless, he was going to not be able to wrestle this season. So he put something out for saying, like, we need the NCAA's help here. We need your help. And what ended up happening here was actually something that turned out to be good because Nebraska put this out over the weekend. They said, we're happy to announce that the NCAA has approved Kyle Berwick's waiver for immediate eligibility. The staffs work together with Nebraska, Wisconsin, and the NCAA, which I want to say, like, first of all, that's awesome that Wisconsin and Nebraska were working together. You don't want to see a kid lose his eligibility. You know, n n like, even if he was part of the, the issue was him not knowing, he shouldn't be he, he really shouldn't be punished. You, you don't like seeing stuff like that happen. But the, like I said, the good thing is that Kyle was ultimately reconsidered and approved for this. And Nebraska, of course, is thankful for all who assisted with the process, and they're looking forward to seeing him make his official debut. And he made his debut this weekend. Yes, he already wrestled this season. He was undefeated 10-0 going into this weekend. He just had a couple of opens, but he did end up wrestling against Minnesota and Northwestern, where, unfortunately, he recorded two losses. One of them was to Chris Cannon, a tough ranked wrestler. But the good thing is, He's a solid guy in the spot now at 133 for the Cornhuskers. And Nebraska ended up did getting a win over a ranked Minnesota, 21-9. And they got a couple of good uh, upset wins. One was Liam Cronin over Patrick McKee at 125 over a top four ranked guy. The other one, that is, it wasn't an upset, but a pretty impressive win was Peyton Raw beating Brayton Lee. And Brayton Lee at one point, I believe in the preseason, was number one ranked. And now Peyton Robb is on a path to, but honestly, potentially win a national title. Now, one of the things, like, Nebraska has a tough team this year. And I just wish Ridge was, was wrestling because that team would just be that much tougher. Now, the other team they beat this weekend was Northwestern. They beat them 22-15. to And this was a good a good weekend for Nebraska all around, uh, really. And my takeaway is just that, like, I'm happy to see that Kyle Berwick got his eligibility, that he's able to actually compete this season, and it's just going to elevate Nebraska. And you see some of those big dual meets, and we got to talk about the insane dual meet weekend because possibly the most upsets out of any weekend so far. And it seems like I keep saying that, but it's the truth, right? But first, we got to talk about some quick lightning headlines the first one is that Mikey Caliendo before the weekend even started it was on Thursday night Caliendo of North Dakota State upset an NCAA champion who was it well that NCAA champion was Shane Griffith and holy moly was this unexpected he earned two takedowns on Shane Griffith to beat him six to three was the final score of that match and I gotta say like this weight class at 165 it's pretty much anybody's game. You got Keegan at the top, you got David Carr, but the rest of this is just in total flux. I'll talk about a 
couple other guys in just a second here. But the other guy that just killed this weekend and dominated was Spencer Lee. And he is on a mission. He puts fear, the fear of God into his opponents. Because, yeah, Iowa cruised past Northwestern, but the story really here was Spencer Lee. Because look at his match against uh, D'Augustino, who's one of the top three ranked guys in the country, okay? Top three ranked guy at the weight. And Spencer Lee just takes him to his back, throws him in a half, and sticks him. And then you see he gets super, like, psyched up. And the thing is, like, yeah, this is a great win, like a ranked win for Spencer Lee. But to see him getting this psyched up, it seems like he has a chip on his shoulder. I don't know what it is. And and I've heard, like, the, the, the silly thing. Well, 125 is a weak weight class. Maybe Spencer Lee is just that far about the competition. That's my thoughts on it. And speaking about guys that actually tie this situation together are, are above a lot of the competition is David Carr. Now, David Carr recorded a pin in the first period, and that ended up getting him 19 wins in a row. Of course, he had that win streak dating back from last year, maybe it even carried over. From, yeah, it was carried over from the year before that. That was broken at the NCAA Championships in 2022 whenever he had that loss. But the reason I'm bringing him and Spencer up is because these are two guys that are honestly in the Hodge Trophy conversation. Of course, Spencer is, but David Carr is as well if he can win that 165-pound weight class and continue that streak going but the one thing that is kind of riding against him is that 165 is anybody's game I mean you, you see Cam Amin here and Dean Hamidi and this is a great win for Cam Amin even though he has a loss on the season but like these guys at 165 it's anybody's game anybody can win this now let's move on to the third wrestling headline which is that the crazy weekend of dual meet upsets may have been the most wild of the entire year. The first one we got to talk about, I mentioned North Dakota State beating Stanford, actually. Actually, I didn't mention that, but with Caliendo's win over Griffith, North Dakota State ended up beating Stanford, a great dual meet victory. The other dual meet that happened is that Indiana, yeah, that team that was like at the bottom of the Big Ten for many, many years, um, they ended up beating Rutgers. Yeah, they did. And that was just after their win over Maryland. And you may be saying, okay, it was over Maryland. Yeah, but Maryland's having a good year this year. They're having a phenomenal season. They beat a top-ranked pit. The other team they beat just this past weekend, the Virginia Duels, was Oklahoma. A perennial Big 12 team. Beat them by a score of 18-16. to 16. Like, it wasn't just one fluke win for Maryland or maybe like some starters were out for a certain team. No, Maryland's in it to win it, man. They were the joke of the Big Ten. I'm sorry, but they were. They were the joke of the Big Ten, the joke of college wrestling. Couldn't win a match. Like 0-33 or something at the Big Ten Championships. And now they're building up. And you got to give Coach Clemson like, like all that support for building up that recruiting class and getting these tough guys in. Now, their success was ended a bit early, yes, by Indiana. But the other team that beat them at the Virginia Duels, actually, was Campbell. They beat the a ranked Maryland. And you see the final score here to this match was 21 to 14. Now, the reason this is impressive is because this is the second win for second Big Ten win for Campbell this season. They beat Purdue just a couple of weeks ago. And interestingly enough, that was Campbell's first ever win against a Big Ten opponent over Purdue. And now they have two in one season. And on top of that, Campbell has, ranked, has wrestled six ranked opponents this year. In the top 25, absolutely incredible. And just, like, these teams are going after it. Big, small, big recruiting class, small rec- It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, I put this tweet out. Which of these teams has impressed you the most this year? And, by the way, they were all unranked in the preseason. Maryland, North Dakota State, West Virginia, who had that win over Pitt. Illinois, who's had a solid Big Ten schedule so far. This season has been insane for dual meets and then the other thing that happened last night was actually Princeton beat Arizona State 24 to 12 Arizona State a top 10 ranked team they were top three until they lost to Cornell and now they lost to Princeton who honestly had no right beating Arizona State and it happened and you talk about other dual meets that happened 
mentioned North Dakota State over Stanford, West Virginia over Chattanooga, Long Island over Davidson. You may say, okay, it's Long Island, but okay, over Davidson, who's a more established program. And then I have this one up too. The Buckeyes beat Rutgers 27-12. to It was an insane weekend all around. And my takeaways and what gets me questioning things here is, like, where do the rankings go from here? These are Intermats rankings right now before the weekend. And you see that, yeah, you got Arizona State at number 10. And you, Mizzou's going to move up. Minnesota just lost. Northwestern, I mean, South South Dakota State's having a great season. But what is this year coming to? The only way to decide the true dual meet victor, yeah, we're going to have some great matches coming up this weekend. I, uh, Penn State and Michigan, Iowa versus Penn State in the upcoming weeks. Virginia Tech and NC State. But I want a dual meet championship right now. Now, if you're interested in another video, I actually toured the Campbell Wrestling Facility a couple months back. And if you want to see what it's like at a D1 school, you got to check out that video. Those were your wrestling headlines.